All right, welcome back everyone. Today we have our final lecture and we're gonna be looking at a master design analysis. And what this is gonna be is really a sort of culmination of everything that we've done in this semester up until this point, all of the different sorts of analyses that we've done of master works is going to be utilized here. So we're gonna be looking back at some images that we've already analyzed for different means. And we're gonna be talking about how you're going to use that uh, to create your analysis and then to complete your final studio problem um, coming up next week. So we're gonna start with this image by Caravaggio, the entombment of Christ. And again, we've already looked at um, positional analysis and proportional analysis, but let's go back over that real quick. Within this painting, there is a golden mean format which can help us to analyze the positionality of the shapes and elements in this image. So we'll look at the way that this image is aligned along the diagonal axis of the golden mean format, that there are other elements that are aligned along the transverse of that diagonal. We can take a square break off the bottom and see that that's an important positional moment for this design. And we can continue to break down this golden mean format into its proportional divisions. So after we've done that, we might take the golden mean spiral and see that the way that it's being used to arrange elements again on this um, picture plane. And moving forward, we can see that the way that Caravaggio is using proportional shapes, these areas of space within the format to create and to position um, the figures in his painting. So each of these shapes, these blue shapes that are showing up are proportional to the overall design, to the golden mean format. And here. So again, this use of proportional analysis to look at how the image is being composed, both in terms of proportional breaks and in position. And there's the image again. We've seen this painting by George Bellows, and we said that it too had a golden mean format within the painting itself, that he's using that bottom row of heads to create a break. Um, that allows for freedom from gravity for the image um, to release it from the bonds of the perceptual force of gravity on this image. Uh, and we can look at the way that diagonals of the square or diagonals of the whole are being used to position, again, these elements, these figures in the painting. This one we never talked about, but it was one of the intros to, um, to your lectures. So here's a painting by Kyle Staver uh, called Trapeze. And we might look at doing a sort of shape analysis. What sort of major shapes is the artist using um, to create this image? Right off the bat, I can see um, two triangles formed in the top figure of the Trapeze artist there. And moving down, I can see an increase in size and a movement from a triangle, triangular shape into a shape that is still geometric, but also is rounder than the triangle there. And from that shape, I can then see this very round organic shape that takes up the trapeze net that is below them. So there's a modulation happening here. There's a modulation in size from small uh, to larger. There's a modulation in shape from triangular sharp to rounder and to finally a very round organic shape at the bottom. There are also a few other major shapes that exist in this design uh, which help to create a sort of contrast. So 
if I'm doing a shape analysis, then of this painting, it might look something like this. Back to our original image. And we looked at the, in the last lecture at um, these paintings by Kerry James Marshall, and we did some light analyses of these paintings by first looking at the image in black and white, and then creating a bar. And we're thinking of this bar representing 100% of the image. And what percentage of this bar is going to be taken up by these very dark charcoals? What percentage of it is absolute black? What percentage of it is lighter, um, possibly approaching middle gray, but again, overall very dark, uh, low minor value key image here. So those are four different kinds of analyses that we can perform. Uh, positional analysis, a proportional analysis, a shape analysis, and a white analysis. And that's what you're going to be doing for your homework. So studio problem number 38, you're going to analyze the size, shape, position, proportion, and light of a master painting. Again, I've already provided you with a list of um, of master painters that you can select from. Uh, do some research, find a work of theirs, um, and analyze all of these different things. So you're gonna need to do a light analysis of it. You're gonna need to do a positional analysis and a shape analysis. Some of these things can be combined, the size and shape, for example, or the position and proportion. So at least three different analyses of a single painting here. And from this analysis, I want you to also make a list. This is a list of ingredients um, used and their proportional relationships. Um, and what do I mean by that? We need to go back to our list of elements of design, right? This is what we started with at the very beginning of the semester. Uh, size, shape, position, texture, value, hue, chroma, and temperature. We haven't dealt with hue, chroma, and temperature, and we're only just now in the last couple of lectures getting into value. Most of what we talked about is in regards to size, shape, position, and a little bit of texture as well. If I'm making a list of ingredients that are being used in a master painting, I need to think about these elements and descriptors for these elements. So for example, if I'm thinking about the shape of something, I might say that the shape is round, it's square, it's geometric or organic, it is acute or sharp, or obtuse and dull, it's concave or convex, etc. These are ways to describe the shapes that exist in the painting that you're going to be analyzing. So make a list of what's being used and again a list of the proportional relationship. Is it half and half geometric and organic? Uh, is there 90% organic shapes with just a small amount of geometric shapes to contrast against that. Listed out what's being used and how much in relation to each other. What is the major unifying element and what is contrasting? If I'm thinking about size, pretty simple, right? There's large, medium, or small. And remember that all of these things are relative. So if you're looking at a very large painting, well, every shape in that painting might be large, right, in relation to you, but in relation to each other, there's going to be variances between large and small. If I'm thinking about the position of something, then I might say that it's at the top, it's at the bottom, the left, right. Um, the orientation is also a kind of position, so is it vertical, is it horizontal, is it diagonal or oblique? Uh, is it in front of something? Is it behind something, right? Position and space in the, the design there, and so on. If I'm thinking about texture, uh, things can be smooth, they can be rough, it can be a tight knit texture, it can be a loose sort of texture as well. And in terms of value, there is, of course, high, middle, and low value, and there's major keys and minor keys, which we've discussed already. So you are compiling a 
list of ingredients and their proportion to each other. What you're essentially doing is you're creating a recipe for the design or the painting that you're looking at. And your final studio problem coming up next week, um, when you prepare to turn in your final portfolio, you're going to then be taking this list of ingredients and you're going to be creating your own design using all of these ingredients, but arranged in your own way um, so that you will be using your master analysis here as a guideline for how to create your own design. Um, there's a couple more things that I wanna talk about um, before we wrap things up. Um, this will be the last lecture and there are just a couple of things that I really want to drive home for you guys um, as the sort of major overarching theme of what we've been doing um, this past semester. So the first thing that you really need to keep in mind when you're thinking about design is that design is the end of art. What this means is that art comes first, the creation of the work comes first, and everything that we've been studying this semester is the end product of that art being made. In other words, generally, most of the time, you don't wanna start with design, with these ideas of design when you go to create your own artwork. That can lead you down a path where you're creating very stiff work um, that is too heavily reliant on the, these ideas of rules um, and guidelines to allow for any real creativity to take place. Um, this ended up happening to me. Um, I had a very good design teacher, um, but I took these ideas from the design class and I would apply them at the front end of a painting, say, that I was making. And what came out were um, very stiff, stilted works. And it took me until I got into to grad school and I was discussing these ideas of design in a painting that I was looking at. And, and my professor had to like poke me in the chest and say, look, this is the end of art. You're, you're looking at this the wrong way. The creativity has to come first. The, the necessity to create has to be the primary motivating factor. So on that note, let's look at this. This is the linear education spectrum. At the left end, at the start, you have the uninitiated, the novice. Um, so this is your Sunday painters, your guy in high school who was good at drawing Dragon Ball Z characters, but never really studied it um, seriously. And so just kind of stuck there. And that's, that's where they're at. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you guys are on a path um, that leads toward mastery. Uh, and you'll notice that the spectrum continues beyond master because art is a never ending pursuit. You're never going to completely know everything that there is about visual communication and design. And that's a good thing. So, but this is a way of building a lifetime engagement in self-education is what this is really about. Um, studying design and visual communication is a way to keep yourself active and engaged for the rest of your life if you choose to do this. But in between these two ends of the spectrum, there exists this whole area right here. And that's where you guys are right now. You've begun your education, but you're not out on the other side of it yet. Um, you are a sophomore in the classic sense of the word. Um, you might hear the word sophomoric to describe a work of art or a song or something that just doesn't really make the cut, that is lacking in some major sense. This whole middle section where you exist right now is a dangerous place because you've started to learn these rules, uh, how visual communication works. But right now, you don't really know 
how to apply them in effective ways. And that comes with time, it's natural. And you might be saying, if design is the end of art, why are we studying it at the very beginning? And this is all maybe sort of paradoxical, but it makes sense to, to study art in this way. So back to this idea that design is the end of art. You should not use design to make art. You shouldn't take these ideas of proportion and size and shape contrast um, and apply them on the front end of uh, your drawing, your design work, your paintings, whatever you're going to make. Um, because when you start from this place of I have an idea about how this is going to operate, then you don't allow the work to communicate to you. And that's the real trick of all of this, is that as you engage in a work of art, the design, the work, will tell you what needs to happen if you're willing to listen to it. Um, but if you start at the outset with these very specific design ideas, um, then you've killed it before it had the chance of coming to fruition. You've suffocated any chance of creativity and spontaneity in the work of art. So art is made from necessity. Humans arose as a species some hundred thousand years ago in Africa. And from that point to today, one of the major things that separates us from other species is the production of art. There is a biological need, and in a very real sense, there's a biological need to create these things, um, sculptures, um, little totems, paintings on cave walls. These things exist perhaps for ritual reasons, perhaps for other reasons, or perhaps for no reason at all except to exist. There are other species, there are birds, for example, who take shiny objects and arrange them in a certain way to make their nest. That doesn't serve the same purpose that art does, because in a lot of ways, art is purposeless. So this thing that we're doing, this very specific thing to humans, art, arises at the same time that we become what we are as human. So there is a something genetic in us, something in our DNA that says this has to be made. And there's an impulse to create, whether that's music or dance or poetry or visual arts, what we're studying here. So this thing that serves no purpose except to exist on its own, this art for art's sake, arises out of a need to express. And that's where your art should come from. That's where you should be producing from, not from outside ideas of how the principles of design can be used to create effective communication. So we study design to make our art effective. Um, because anybody can pick up a pencil and create an image. But only the really effective ones are the ones that we're still looking at today from 500 years ago, from a thousand years ago or more. What's effective sticks with us. So we have to study what's come before and the design choices that were made before so that we can understand how things are made effectively. But the art should come out in a natural way, in a spontaneous way that responds to the work itself and its own necessities. So you should think of studying design as a separate sort of track from the production of art that you're going to be making. The study of design feeds into your making of arts, but they're not the same thing, if this makes sense. 
the thing to to realize with this is as you study design, as you study masterworks, this is going to help your own art grow. As you make your own art over time, this will help it grow. So it's only through time that your art will grow and be very effective. Right now in this sophomoric stage, you're going to make a lot of bad art. And that's perfectly fine. That's what you're in school to do, is to make bad art. So that you can get that out of the way and create even more powerful, good art. But even once you've reached a maturing point and you're making, quote, good art, um, you'll still make plenty of bad stuff. If we look at someone like Pablo Picasso, right, he probably didn't have a very good batting average if he was a baseball player. Um, he struck out a lot. He made a lot of terrible art, but the key is that he made so much that only the cream rises to the top, and that's what he'll be remembered for. So speaking of Picasso, let's take this idea of maturing with time and, and look at it uh, in his own work. This is a painting from 1896 called First Communion. Um, Picasso made this when he was 15 years old. And you might say, wow, this is an amazing painting, for, especially for a 15 year old. And in a lot of ways it is. In terms of design and effective communication, it's not good at all. It's very bad. Um, the bright, bright, super bright white of the communal robe that the woman, that the little girl is wearing and the white, the drapery of the altar and the altar boy standing there is far too light in relation to the rest of the image. It jumps forward um, in a way that destroys the space of the image. This might not be something that you can see right now, but I'm just telling you how this image is working. The white of the altar and the communal um, gown that she's wearing jumps out at us in space and everything else in the painting retreats far back so that you have two planes of existence really in this painting. You have the white in the painting and everything else that exists behind it. It's hard to see the painting as a whole because the white jumps out so far in space that you can only focus on what is closest to you. And then you can focus on what's behind it, but you can't see everything at once, which is what good design is about. It's about an immediate communication. This communication is hampered by the space that it's creating through visual perceptual phenomenon. Okay, so now let's look at a painting from 11 years later. This is La Demoiselles d'Avignon uh, from 1907. And at this point, Picasso is around 26 years old. And this is it. This is um, his first real major, super major masterpiece right here. Um, and you can say, oh, well, the other painting is more beautiful and this painting is ugly. And that has nothing at all to do with effective communication. This painting is ugly. It's um, terrifying in a lot of ways to look at all the sharp angles and everything. It's um, not a pleasant painting, but it is effective visually. And the space in this painting is a unified space. He's no longer dealing with this problem of things jumping far too out and things receding too far back anymore. This is a consistent, immediate message here that is created by a bunch of similar shapes that then have contrasting shapes thrown against it. So there is a unity and a contrast here that the other painting lacks. This painting, the First Communion, communicates narratively. And there's nothing wrong with narration in a painting, but we read this painting through what we know about these very specific um, Christian, probably Catholic um, rites of passage. And it doesn't hold a lot 
of any other real form of communication. So this is communicating narratively first and foremost, and really only it's communicating in a narrative sense. This painting communicates narratively. If we know a little backstory of what this is a painting of, this is a painting of um, prostitutes of Avignon Street in Paris. So there is narration happening, but that's never the really important part of visual communication because visual communication isn't concerned with narration. If it were, then it would just be a book. Visual communication is concerned with exactly that, visual communication. So this communicates visually first and foremost in all ways. And that's the difference between these two paintings. Now it's significant that I selected these two paintings which are 11 years apart. Okay, it's going to take you 10 years or 10,000 hours to become a master. This is in any field. Um, they've done different sorts of studies on this. There's a book by Malcolm Gladwell called The Outliers, um, which I believe looks at um, little kids uh, in a hockey league, actually, and that the kids who were born earlier in the year, so they've had just that much more time to practice in their lives, becoming better players than their, their counterparts on average because of this milestone of 10,000 hours spent studying something. So this, again, this applies really across the spectrum of anything that you wanna become a master of. I've been studying art in a serious way for 12 years and I hold a master of fine arts degree. Um, I still wouldn't call myself a true master or anything. Like I said, this looking back at that linear education um, spectrum there, this is a continuing education. It's a self-education that you engage in when you work in your studio, when you go to museums and look at major works of art, um, looking at art and books or online or anything. This is something, this study of visual communication will sustain you for the rest of your life if this is what you wanna do. You've made it through design one, you really are at a point where you need to decide if this is actually the pursuit for you or not. Um, my professor in design uh, left us with this. Art is a hard way to make a living, but an excellent way to make a life. So you're at the point now in this sophomoric state where you need to decide if you're going to continue this path or not. There's nothing wrong with choosing against it, but right now you're in this dangerous place where you haven't mastered something, you've only just begun to unravel the mystery of it. And you can't really apply the lessons that you've learned yet because you haven't had enough time to internalize them and then figure out the way that you're going to use them for your own personal means. So that's really the huge takeaway that I want you guys to have from this class and what design is and what it does and the way that you should use it going forward. So if you have any questions, send me an email.
You're wrong. 